Hello, my name is Jonah Gelzo, Audio Tots Plus author, and in this tutorial we're going to be focusing on the very powerful and robust Movie Slate Digi Slate app software. And we're going to learn all the bells and whistles and everything you need to know to really harness the power of this wonderful app. So without further ado, let's get started. With our Wi-Fi Master Wi-Fi Hotspot still enabled, let's open up the Movie Slate app software and go over the powerful feature set so you'll be comfortable with the interface and be able to fully utilize what this app has to offer. With the app loaded up, you'll notice along the bottom are various tabs. Select the Settings tab. To unlock the richness of this app, you will need to purchase additional in-app plugins such as the Timecode Sync and Sound Department plugin. First and foremost, you'll want to install the Timecode Sync plugin to interface the software with the Timecode Buddy system, as well as additional options for sending and receiving timecode via headphone jack, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and more. If you're a production sound mixer like me, then you'll also benefit by the increased productivity that the Sound Department plugin will offer you in a way of easily managing Sound Department metadata and being able to email off sound reports at the end of the day. Assuming you have both plugins installed, let's go back to the main Movie Slate display by selecting the Movie Slate tab along the bottom menu bar. Here's our default Digi Slate display. From top to bottom, we have our virtual clapperboard, Slate, Roll, Scene, Take Displays, our timecode readout, the project title box, as well as CDL display, which corresponds for post color correction workflows and frames per second settings. Below that, we have our director listed, the current date, and further below, our director of photography, camera letter designation, and lastly, whether or not our scene occurs indoors or out at nighttime, or if we're shooting a take without sound. To get started with Movie Slate, let's select the production field. We're presented with a dialog box that lets us know Movie Slate is missing data, and asks us to input unit, department, and name info. Let's hit OK and input our relevant data. Now, the logger info window allows us to input unique identifiers that differentiate between various loggers working on a show. In this case, the current logger is myself. I'll go ahead and input Unit 1 as my unit. Hitting the Next Field option, I'll notate my particular department as the Sound Department. I'll input my name for future records and label the title demystifying timecode. I'll get out of the logger info window and then select the production box once again. We now have the option to input various data for creation of a new project we might be working on, of which all are shot logs, camera department settings, sound department notes, and multicam logs will be saved and stored and can later be called up and exported in a variety of ways for when handing things off to post-production. Let's go through and quickly throw in some project information. I'll put in the name of this project. If you are working on episodic television or a web series, you might want to include a number within the episode display. And I'll put in Envato as the producer. Continuing down, we have more fields to properly outfit our project info such as client name, address, and phone number. Additionally, we have fields that represent and record the type of camera and sound recorders that we're shooting and recording with. Under camera format, we'll want to list what our project will be shot on. You'll notice upon opening this field, we're prompted with an availability of quick insertable data corresponding to a lot of popular shooting platforms out there, referred to as snippets. So we can select from the available list. In my case, we're shooting on the Canon T3i, so I'll highlight that option and select Insert. Additionally, if we were shooting on multiple cameras, you can throw in a comma and insert another camera type. Or we can hit the X and clear all data in the field, and by moving above, we can manually type in a camera type not already listed. 
Via the Groups tab, you can additionally scroll through and select via various subgroups of snippet options. Later on, you'll see how snippets are a powerful tool, and by creating your own snippet additions, you can increase the speed of your data input across the board. Next, let's designate the sound recorder being used, along with the proper sound media, as well as sound file type. Most inexpensive recorders without timecode capability record directly as .wav files. B-WAV files refer to the broadcast WAV format, which is the same as a .WAV file except for the fact that there is additional metadata ability within the sound file. B-WAV file types will be the most prevalent with more professional recorders and timecode enabled recorders. You can also designate if you're recording your multi-track files as separate monotracks are containing all multi-tracks within one poly WAV file, which contains all tracks within the one. When it comes to sample rates for film, the standard is 48 kilohertz when interfacing with digital cinema cameras shooting just below true 24 frame at 23.98 frames per second. However, regardless, it's crucial to always check with the post-production supervisor for the project to determine exactly what frame rate, bit depth, and sample rate are to be used. Never show up on set just assuming what the delivery specs are supposed to be. Always double check. You'll notice slight speed variations above or below 48 kilohertz. This is often used when pulling up or down the playback speed of the sound recordings when interfacing with actual film reels. This can also be the case when shooting true 24 frame on compatible digital cinema cameras with the ultimate intention of laying back to actual real film reels. If this was in fact the case, you would then choose 48.08 kHz. Again, frame rates and sample rates should be set very intentionally and if not done so, could cause problematic issues for later syncing picture and sound in post. When it comes to bit depth, the standard is 24-bit, which gives you the increased dynamic range to be able to capture the rich dialogue on set. Lastly, we have the option to set a sound reference tone. Typically, this is listed and tone was printed to a track at the beginning of each day of shooting, used in post as a way to calibrate levels for future broadcast. Today, many of the old ways of doing location sound are slowly becoming less crucial and many have mixed opinions on how etiquette should be handled on set. With our project data inputted, we'll hit done. Let's now break down the top display boxes corresponding of our slate, roll, scene, and take display boxes. Most are familiar with scene and take numbers which correspond to a written script. Notating the scenes and takes visually allows to more efficiently shoot out of sequence to then later systematically compile in the edit. Let's say we're shooting scene 17. We can then either through gestures swipe up to increase the number or more easily just select the box and manually enter the data. In addition to the number keypad, we have the option to delete the field, to delete one character at a time, to insert letters via the letter tab, or advance our scene by number or letter one at a time. In film, there are typically many shot setups for covering each scene properly, and each subsequent shot setup should be designated as the scene number followed by a letter. So the first shot, which might typically be your master wide shot, would be designated scene 17, with then the following close-up, medium shot, over the shoulder shot, as 17A, 17B, and so forth. Again, any time a camera is moved, or even when a lens is swapped out, add the next progressive letter to the scene number. Moving on to the take display box, we're able to change or advance our takes in the same way as a scene box, as is the same way many of these text or number boxes work. However, where we have to manually change and update our scene numbers and letters, the take display box will advance manually. To initiate a take, simply click on the virtual clapper board, a countdown will occur, followed by a clap, and the digi slate turning red, bringing more focus on the precise timecode data. Freezing this point in time later in an editing application can help to manually sync picture with audio if for any reason timecode issues arise in the recorder or camera, 
will then be brought to another screen where we can either input shot data via a number of methods or end the take. Let's end the take for now as we'll delve into these various options later. Having ended the take, we can see how our take number has automatically increased in value. We can adjust the take value if there is any mistake or a hiccup on set. Otherwise, each take should always have a unique take number, which increments by single values. In addition, you'll also notice that our slate display box has advanced a number. More on that in a second. Let's say we've done 10 various takes for our master wide shot for scene 17. When we're ready to move on to our next shot setup, or a completely different scene, our take number will reset back to 1. So if we move on to scene 34, our take will auto reset to 1. Moving back to the slate display box, you'll notice that with each take and progressing scenes, our slate number will continue to auto increment. The slate box display is a visual record of how many times the slate has been struck. So scene after scene, take after take, the slate number will continue to increase, showing us exactly how many actual takes in entirety have been taken serving as yet another designation for being able to confirm and find a specific take later on in the edit room. Lastly, let's talk about the roll display box. Now that even most amateur and professionals shoot on digital formats, much of our terminology is still borrowed from the film days. In terms of the roll, roll pertains to each progressing roll of film reel used on set. That being said, every time a roll of film was shot, and replaced with a fresh roll of film, the clapper loader or second assistant camera operator would then notate on the slate that they are now on their second roll of film for the day and so forth and so on. When it comes to digital, we no longer swap out film reels or even digital tapes for that matter, but now swap out reusable flash storage media. Each time you swap out a card and replace with another, you could sequentially notate the change with an increase in number. However, many digital cameras have their own way of designating the proper roll number. For instance, with the RED cameras, anytime a card is taken out and put back in, a roll number designation will be made and will be included in the footage metadata. For example, a number such as A001-C001. When a card would be swapped out, that number might then change to A002-C001, and so forth. So consult the post-production supervisor or camera team to know exactly what specifics should be notated within the role designation field. Within the bottom left three display boxes, via a simple gesture, we can swipe over to reveal a blank area upon which we can load a production logo. Simply tap the empty area and access an image from your camera roll. Moving over, the CDL display, or Color Decision List display box, is used to display a look ID used for color correction purposes. CDL stands for Color Decision List and is a format for the exchange of basic primary color grading information between equipment and software. Look ID numbers refer to slope, power, offset, as well as RGB stuff and a bunch of other things you won't have any clue about if you're not a colorist. But if you're consulting a colorist, you now know where to input his look ID. Next to the look ID, we can easily change our frames per second settings on our slate as well as adjusting our frame rate on our Buddy Wi-Fi Master. The date field is pretty self-explanatory and will automatically update unless you manually choose to set it otherwise. Below we have the camera designation field. When running multiple cameras on a shoot, it's always advisable to label the corresponding cameras by letter designations. Then depending upon what cameras are rolling on a scene, you want to add the appropriate cameras to the camera field. So if we're just shooting a particular scene with B camera, for example, then set it to B. Lastly, it's always important to designate whether you're shooting an interior or exterior shot. Shooting at night, shooting without sound by designating MOS, or any combination of such. MOS is a term that is still clouded in mystery as to what it really stands for. Many believe it to be a German filmmaker who, instead of saying without sound, could not speak English well and said mit out sound. I personally go with motor only sync. 
pertaining to the idea that the camera is only rolling, which in the old days had no way of recording sound. Let's come back up to the top for DigiSlate, comprising of the virtual clapper sticks. Again here we have the option to swipe and reveal additional field entries. Swiping over to the right, we reveal some helpful options. Pertaining to the current take, we can take notes about the shot via the note tab, take a photo of the location or the scene for making sure continuity within the film is in order or any number of other reasons, or record a helpful voice memo, bring up color bars for calibration with cameras, a screen for adjusting our contrast settings, such as the gray card, as well as bringing up a pattern for focusing the camera, such as a focus chart. Swiping back to the left, we bring up a title field display where we can designate via snippets whether a shot was a pickup, retake, or b-roll. Or we can easily input whatever essential title for the specific shot that we want. Swiping once more is an additional data display. And you'll see later on how we can fully customize our display boxes to tailor the movie slate to our specific needs. With our Digi Slate, we aren't just limited to its use in the landscape orientation, but rather can simply tilt the Digi Slate to update it to the portrait orientation. However, if you want to keep the Digi Slate from rotating unwantedly, simply press the lock button to the left of the virtual clapper sticks. This will lock whatever current orientation is in use. Let's go ahead and hit the virtual clapper sticks to initiate another take. After the shot has been marked, we have the option to either end the shot without any notation or can have the option to name our shot or can input notes via the note tab utilizing snippets pre-generated or additional snippets via the group tab. Or we can manually type in notes of our choosing. If you're inserting snippets but wish each snippet to insert below the previous snippet, just ensure add line breaks is set to on. Otherwise, your snippets will insert in a horizontal manner. To create multiple notes for a shot, simply select the Next Note icon to create a fresh note. Next, via the camera icon, we can take photos with the built-in camera. or utilize a photo already in our camera roll folder. Or we can even choose to create a sketch from scratch. Moving on, we'll see the mic icon enabling us to make any voice memos that might be beneficial to production or post. The key tab is our keywords note tab, allowing us to insert relevant shot snippets or type in any beneficial keywords to further help describe the current shot for organizational purposes as we'll see later on. Below we can rate the quality of the picture and sound by giving it a rating of up to 5 stars. This can be another useful tool for weeding out the best shots later on in the edit. Just slide your finger up or down to set the star value. If the director really fancied a particular shot, then you might want to select the circle take option, as this is a useful tool to track down those magic moment takes that will be a sure winner in post. If for whatever reason a false take was preemptively rolled, you can simply select the false take option, and our digi slate will return to the same slate values before having marked the shot. To the right, via location services, we have the option to notate our shot's current GPS coordinates, which can then later be recalled on a map. This is a great tool for keeping track of locations where scenes were shot in case specific areas would need to be revisited at a later time for pickups or reshoots. We'll go into detail about how to call up log information later. Since we've ended the shot and are brought back to the main screen, let's talk about the timecode display window. To enact any timecode changes, simply press on the timecode display. This will make visible a number keypad from which we can manually input timecode data. We can choose to run our timecode generated from our iPad internal clock, or we can enter data only mode by pressing on the circle with the line through it. 
This might be a preference when multiple camera and sound recorders are not needed for syncing, hence just needing visual notations of scene and take info. To exit out of data only mode, just tap the timecode area. Accessing again our timecode options, you'll notice the sync button. From here we have a choice as to send or receive timecode, our option to connect to our timecode buddy Wi-Fi master, or to even sync to a song. Taking a look at our send timecode options, we have the option to feed timecode from the internal iPad clock generator via its external headphone jack. With a special cable available from Movie Slate's website, you can send audible timecode in the form of LTC, that stands for linear or longitudinal timecode, which is an encoding of SMPTE time timecode data in an audio signal. Via this method, you can then jam sync or by a hardwire feed or wirelessly transmit timecode data via an audio signal to any camera or device that can read and accept LTC. You'll notice that when I enact the sending of LTC, you'll hear audio pulses, which is the timecode being encoded as audio information. Keep in mind though that all clock generators are not equal. An iPad's internal clock will be more susceptible to timecode drift than would be a location sound recorder's or the timecode buddy Wi-Fi master's own internal clock. You can also send the iPad's generated timecode data via Wi-Fi to any other iOS device running Movie Slate app software. Just make sure the other devices running Movie Slate are set to Wi-Fi receive mode. If we press on the timecode display again, we'll have a few more options available to us. First off, we can stop sending that data via Wi-Fi, and we can also get back into our timecode and manually adjust its properties. We can also send our timecode data via Bluetooth to any iOS device running Movie Slate that is set to receive via Bluetooth as well. We can also receive the timecode data via LTC for our iPad Digi Slate via our headphone jack as well as Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. When wanting to interface with our timecode buddy Wi-Fi master, we simply ensure that our iPad is connected to our buddy Wi-Fi master's Wi-Fi hotspot. Once our iPad is connected, simply select connect to TC buddy and our connection will occur. Once our buddy and Digi Slate have made the connection, a small confirmation bar will appear with flashing lights, confirming sync between devices, as well as showing that we're connected to TC Buddy 001. We're also updated on the TC Buddy's current battery level, and we'll be alerted when the battery level is excellent, good, and at critical levels. By pressing on the small TC Buddy bar, we can instantly see just at what level our battery level is at. To stop our TC Buddy Sync at any time, simply press on the timecode display area to bring up our options. We can either choose to stop our sync, again access Wi-Fi Send capabilities directly from Movie Slate to another compatible device, edit TC Buddy settings, or edit our timecode. All the available settings are the same as are available within the Timecode Buddy app Digi Slate software, so we won't need to go over them again. And at the bottom, we can also open up our Buddy web view to view manuals and other relevant Buddy information like before. One more sync option we have is to directly sync our timecode to a song. Simply select a musical track and you're good to go. This is great for shooting sync for a music video with multiple cameras shooting an actor doing lip sync. To finish up our overview of the main DigiSlate screen, I want to briefly showcase a few more available options relating to the timecode display window. To quickly increase the visual size of our timecode data to make it more readily seen by our cameras, locate the bottom left of the timecode window and press the outward pointing arrows. This will blow up our timecode display so that it utilizes the entirety of our iPad screen. This might be helpful if, for whatever reason, our clapper loader is unable to be close to the camera for the camera to visually see the data properly, so we then might want to blow up the timecode readout to make it easier to capture. Just press the same symbol to go back to our normal view. 
We can also swipe left to reveal additional field display boxes, or swipe right to visually display our user bits, and additional field entry display boxes as well. As you can see, Movie Slate is a very powerful and robust Digi Slate with lots of options, flexibility, customizability, and organizational aids for the filmmaker. In the top left corner of our timecode readout, we're also given a symbol that allows us to quickly see whether our DigiSlate is currently synced with another device via the circular arrows, will be blank if no sync is present, or will showcase a clock symbol when our DigiSlate is operating on the iPad's internal clock. Well, that wraps this tutorial focusing on the Movie Slate app software. In the next installment of our series, we're going to be delving into all the additional bells and whistles that this powerful app has to offer, as far as the Sound Department plugin, the new Multicam plugin, and also the Timecode Sync plugin. As always, keep exploring the possibilities of sound. I'm Jonah Gelzo. Thanks for watching.